I'm Maria Zamet. I'm a past president of the World Affairs Council of Hampton Roads, and it's great to be back among old friends and meet new ones. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, however, I'd first like to acknowledge Bill Clifford's own superb efforts as WACA's president on the eve of his retirement. Um, he has done a lot for the organization, and uh, since I was vice chairman on the national board and served on the board for many years, back in the dark ages, that's why most of you don't know me, um, I can speak with some credibility on the terrific progress and achievements that WACA has enjoyed on the national stage under Bill's tenure. So thank you, Bill, for all your... Okay. Okay. Now, uh, by way of introducing both of our speakers and framing the keynote address, um, I'd like to quote from Michael O'Hanlon's writings. Now, I am con collapsing the text a bit, so just picture ellipses in your mind. And I quote, military analysis is not an exact science. To return to the wisdom of Sun Tzu and paraphrase the great Chinese political philosopher, it is at least as close to art. However, if our main goal in analysis is generally to illuminate choices, rule out bad options, avoid cavalier, careless, and agenda-driven decision-making, we therefore need to study the science of war as well and avoid hubris in our predictions about how any war or any other major military endeavor will ultimately unfold. So for me, that quote is a wonderful segue from Mr. O'Hanlon, Dr. O'Hanlon, a leading strategic analyst, to my good friend and leading military practitioner, General Philippe Levine. This study of options to maximize outcomes and avoid careless decision-making is exactly what General Levine does each and every day and does so very well. And his expertise as a practitioner could not come at a more timely moment, both for this conference as well as for NATO. In fact, it is so timely, I was afraid he'd be called to Brussels before he could even show up here. So we're glad you made it. Um, I had the privilege of first meeting General Levine at his change of command ceremony at Allied Command Transformation headquarters in Norfolk back in May 2021. And since his very first day here, he has become a much beloved and engaged member of our local community. His keen sense of humor, his love of rugby, <laughs> and his willingness to jump in to all that Hampton Roads has to offer, including some of its pubs, I might add, have been a tremendous boost, not only for our region, but on the national stage for ACT as well, as he, his unrelenting work and efforts have raised ACT's profile here in Washington and throughout the country. An appreciation of both hard and soft power is infused in his very nature. And that million dollar smile is for real. Um, and it's also this appreciation of both hard and soft, or as they say now, smart power, brings me back to Michael O'Hanlon, who has been advocating that strategic blend for years. Since I'm sure that just about everyone here is familiar with oh, Mr. Hanlon's writings, his thousands of interviews, I think over 4,000, since maybe more now since 9-11, as well as his over a dozen books and several hundred op-eds. It's um, his amazing productivity and the fact that he's been such a good friend to World Affairs Council. So both of these gentlemen's bios are in your programs and I do encourage you to read them. They're, they're incredibly impressive. So as a result, I still haven't figured out when or if either one of you ever sleep. But well, of all of uh, your accomplishments, Michael O'Hanlon, one of my favorites is you're trying to disprove um, Einstein's general theory of relativity, relativity while a student at Princeton. So now, please give a warm welcome to both General Philippe Levine and later to Michael O'Hanlon. Thank you very much, Maria, for these kind words and uh, to quote Sun Tzu, of course. 
And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Clifford Dear Bill, uh, to invite me uh, today to share uh, with you. And ladies and gentlemen, so as you have seen, uh, world affairs, remember uh, the video, uh, world affairs are not getting better or easier. Apologize in advance for disturbing uh, uh, the end of this uh, lunch with some, of, uh, um, with some observation. And quite frankly, I realized that I could have chosen uh, another themes for my intervention. Instead of talking about the art of war, I could have talked about the art of the table. And uh, I could have uh, entertained uh, you with the French cuisine. <laughs> but no. <laughs> Anyway, let's stick uh, to the initial topic, NATO, and the future of uh, warfare. So the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, return of war in Europe triggered by the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine are two emblematic examples of as, uh, the as yet unpredictable consequences of a new global instability that spans from climate change to economic uh, warfare. I want pretend um, to have a solution to all problems uh, of the world, but in the field of expertise, uh, the future of NATO as a political military organization, allow me to share with you s my vision and some uh, of the avenues we are exploring and implementing to, to help restore balance. Well, it is uh, certainly more difficult to characterize uh, conflicts in the 21st century than uh, it was before. And um, I want to take the example uh, of Crimea annexation in uh, 2014. Some said uh, that we were too slow to react and uh, that we were merely enduring a uh, hostile uh, initiative. And this is in a part a valid uh, observation. And at that time, we were not fully prepared to deal with uh, ambiguity and uh, probably less equipped to understand the new reality that was emerging. Since we have learned a lot and uh, we have come to realize that the lines between the military instruments of power and the others have become uh, increasingly blurred. That the fog of the war is likely to grow in the coming years, urging us to find ways to clear it. That new domains such as cyber or space carry new challenges and actual threats and that simultaneity of actions for their sequence is as important to understand as the action themselves. And that our openness induced by our democratic values has long been targeted by our competitors and opponents leading us to develop resilience and cognitive superiority as part of our lines of defense. And above all, we have understood that the notion of speed is more than ever key to any operation, and not only in the execution phase. But I will come back on this notion in a few minutes. Based on these lessons, NATO has initiated a transformation that must be continued and even accelerated. Last July, at the Madrid summit, the United States and government adopt a new strategic concept. This transformational summit has confirmed our objectives and allows for their implementation within a coherent framework through the respective concept of each NATO two strategic commands, which is a light command operation and a light command transformation. And you have, in US, one of these two strategic commands on your soil. I'm sure that you understand of the symbolic value for the transatlantic bond of having an American general in Europe, John Christophe Cravoli. He was uh, uh, two weeks ago uh, in, in Norfolk with us. While I, a French European general, exercise my, my prerogatives from uh, the North American continent. This geographical proximity allows for intellectual permeability and a kind of symbiosis between the prospective work of the United States and NATO. But moreover, what makes us strong is our unity, the unity of 30 and soon 32 sovereign states that share uh, the same democratic values 
the same attachment to fundamental freedom. The signing of a strategic concept is the result of a process of reflection, analysis and sharing which draw our, on our diversity and multiplies individual possibilities. That is what has made the alliance strong for other 70 years and what makes it legitimate. Finland and Sweden have the same community of interest, the desire to participate in the common effort of preserving peace and stability in Europe. And so, the, for example, the integration of Finland and Sweden is a formidable uh, opportunity. And as a supreme allied commander transformation, I am responsible for the integration and for its military dimension. But what are my responsibilities? It can be explained, and we, li we love acronyms in, uh, in, uh, in NATO. We, <laughs> we love uh, acronyms very much. So, ACT <laughs> for Allied Command Transformation, but ACT is also A for anticipation, C for capabilities, and T for talents. So, to anticipate is to see and foresee. So, I've just talked about uh, future challenges and the increasing complexity of our global security environment that intensifies the fog of war. We first need to equip ourselves with the means to see through this fog, to better understand the new reality of our security environment and the inflection points. It means that we have to constantly monitor the situation and assess it. We have to better detect the weak but the significant signals that our opponents try to conceal or mask among the background noise and to process them at the speed of relevance in all domains and environments. The digital era presents us more with more challenges, but also more opportunities, which uh, we have to exploit better and faster than adversaries. So if A is for anticipation, C is for capabilities. I'm responsible for the overall coherence and synchronization of NATO nations' capability development. Of course, nations are sovereign in terms of capability, but you will agree with me that a powerful alliance needs a comprehensive toolbox across all military domains. Once NATO's political and military ambition is determined, and we are working on that today, we must set individual targets and identify the capability gaps. ACT also advocates for a new and agile development model, able to keep pace with new technologies. Agile development must now become the new normal. Our soldiers deserve it, and our edge is at stake. In short, ACT asks, acts as a force multiplier by taking off the interoperability layer. Interoperability is one of my greatest responsibility. Interoperability is the NATO ad NATO's added value, what makes the world richer than the sum of every individual's. The last letter, T, is for talents, because like every organization, NATO needs the right people at the right time and place. And so the civilian and military personnel has to be well educated and trained, fit for, fit to purpose and combat ready. We also work at identifying the talents NATO needs today and will need in the future, mainly by expanding our networks and partnership. In ACT, we have a natural connection with the traditional defense industry, of course. And ACT, with and through the nation, has worked to reach out to non-traditional industrial actors, such as startups, mainly in the innovation sector, and to academia, which prove to be mutually beneficial. This is a part, it is, this is part of the agility I was referring to earlier. By partnering with private sector companies or innovation department, NATO gains access to the latest technologies and consider future development for operational use. On our side, we offer realistic testing grounds with real inputs and requirements, which helps to improve products and gain business leads. Tomorrow, with DIANA, another acronym, Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, we will, beautiful, 
we will be <laughs> we will be able to scale up this process to design to the design dimension and enabling the timely delivery to our warfighters of adequate tools in sufficient quantity. So anticipation, capabilities, talents. Uh, that's one key to transforming NATO. But if I were to name only one parameter that is crucial to NATO's transformation and its ability to deal with future challenges, it will be, as I say, speed. So the fighter pilot's motto is, speed is life. Is the gospel in the combat. As a fighter pilot myself, I have long been familiar with this principle, which is more relevant than ever. Of course, we can think about the weapons themselves. And I will not dwell here on the decisive advantage that a personic missile or quantum computing will give. But it, will, it is on the whole, whole process of monitoring, detection, analysis, reporting, and decision making that we must go faster than our opponents. This need for speed requires a digital transformation, which must be based on the use of the data and artificial intelligence. In short, digital transformation is the ability to produce data and to make it consumable by anyone who is entitled to it, providing a decisive operational advantage. It means that data must be seamless shared and processed between allies and throughout the chain of command. And to, to achieve this level of interoperability, we have to massively improve access to data and how we process this mass at the speed of relevance. To better understand this concept, I invite you to use your mind's eye. Picture a small unit. It is expecting an enemy offensive. And the rumble of approaching tanks is growing but more audible every second. A surgeon, self sergeant, reach for our most potent weapon, our smartphone. And yes, there is an app for that. Using using that app, using that app, she can call up via commercial satellite connection all kinds of near immediate fires and other non kinetic support. This is no science fiction. This is almost happening today in Ukraine. Now, we need to be able to scale this process up to the nation, to the alliance level. And there, we face a difficulty. On the one hand, we need more and more data, which will make situation more and more complex, and thus, thus difficult to process and uh, analyze for the human mind. On the, on the other hand, to keep the, your, our edge, we must be able to uh, always decide, act, and faster than our competitors and adversaries. This is where we need artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is, has the ability to sort and simplify, to make a complex issue understandable by presenting only relevant parameters to the analyst, the operator, or the decision maker. Artificial intelligence is not intended to decide for us, but to influence us but it must help to see more clearly in military strategic terms, we will say that the role of artificial intelligence is to clear the fog of war. It implies a political commitment for better sharing, data sharing by changing the rules that prevent us today from harnessing relevant data in a timely manner. Data and artificial intelligence are instrumental in implementing our digital transformation. And digital transformation is how NATO will be able to conduct multi-domain operations. But what are multi-domain operations? That's the heart of my topic, the future of warfare. Today, we know how to coordinate military operations across several of the five military domains. We know how to do joint operation up to a greater level of complexity. Uh, the typical joint operation is uh, Operation Overlord in Normandy, back in World War II. At the time, we execute stove pipe, pre-plan operation in several domains. In Afghanistan, we execute operation in multiple domains, but in a permissive environment, 
with uh, technological supremacy. Today, what is new? What will have to deal with tomorrow? We will have to fight, of course, in a non-permissive environment. Our, our adversaries will take the competition and the fight everywhere, inside and outside the five military domains, especially where our readiness is lower. And agility is paramount, as is speed of weapons, of information, and the level of the new intensity. All have to be taken into account. At least NATO must be able to match these threats and reach these new levels. Across all domains, multi-domain operation will guarantee that at all level of command, all level command, strategic, operational, and tactical, they have a real-time awareness and of delivered and available effect, allowing seamless synchronization. But more, multi-domain is also about expanding the network to have access to other capabilities from other instruments of powers to support and or increase the military instrument of power. And on a battlefield, MDO will enable a warfighter to leverage any available sensor or effector, it could be military or not, across all domains. So MDO is the way for NATO to keep its edge. I'm about to conclude, and before I turn the floor over to uh, Michael, I would like to end my remarks about with the notion that I think is essential, resilience. When speed is such an important parameter, resilience has the power to give you time in addition to strengthening your deterrence and defense posture. Resilience has also a deterrent effect. At ACT, we have work on the notion of resilience, and we have framed the concept of layer resilience, which states that our capacity to resist and recover from shocks relies on having strong military and civilian layers, but also the reliability and the quality of their interaction. Here, too, the upcoming integration of Sweden and Finland will be a great opportunity to benefit from the formidable experience acquired by both countries whose resilience model is based on conscription and readiness of a society. Well, I hope I didn't spoil the, your, uh, the end of your lunch uh, with my comment, but uh, I finally told myself that uh, although I'm French but not a chef, I'm uh, much more qualified to talk about the art of war than the art of the table. Or I could have spoken about the art of rugby, but it will be for the next time. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Great to see you, General. Thank you very much. Uh, good humor to inject into a discussion of NATO concepts uh, at a tough time, so we appreciate the serious work as well as the ability that you have to make it accessible and uh, even entertaining in some sense. But I, I wanted to hone in now a little bit on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And because you are leading Alliance uh, Command Transformation, I'm sure you're studying the battlefield and trying to figure out what it tells us about where we've come in war and where we need to go. And so I wanted to ask you to be a little bit specific in regard to the Ukraine conflict. And you've given us some very, uh, very nice abstract concepts and some big ideas. Can we hone in a little bit? And I guess the question I would put to you in watching the war in Ukraine so far, what do you find sort of the newest, most different, especially where technology has created new opportunities or new methods of war fighting, but also what do you find the most sort of traditional, the most unchanging? What aspects of warfare are not changing that fast for all these new gizmos and all these new concepts? So, so what's new and what's not new on the Ukrainian battlefield so far? Well, what was, maybe new is, is a little bit strong because uh, we, we've got already a concept agreed by the head of state of, of government, as I explained to you, is uh, the concept of how to, how to make the, the operation in, on the battlefield, how to be ready, how to, uh, what are the plans to, uh, to do that, and uh, how to, uh, to develop the, the forces and the, and the capabilities. And it was agreed before the, the war in Ukraine. 
So um, we have seen, for example, the, the necessity uh, to, uh, um, to defend ourselves, but not, maybe not only to defend, but to have this cognitive superiority. So infor information sphere, environment, is uh, there is a huge competition in, in, in this. And of course, you have seen uh, at the beginning of the war, there was a, l a huge uh, uh, um, competition in, in, in this, this sphere. And uh, uh, we must say that uh, President Zelensky and uh, uh, the Ukrainian authorities are, have, have won the battle of this uh, uh, infosphere um, uh, at the beginning of, of, of the war. So it's, it's a thing which is new by the intensity yeah. of the competition. Um, we have seen also that command and control is essential uh, uh, to, uh, to win a battle. And you know that in a war there are a lot of battles. Um, and so uh, a two vertical C2 without agility is uh, less powerful than uh, uh, um, a very um, huge agility. And, and I think it's something that um, when I'm speaking about digital transformation, when uh, we are sp speaking about cross-domain command, it's the way that has to, uh, uh, we have to go uh, um, in order to, to decide faster and, 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 and so uh, to act faster. Um, a new thing maybe is, uh, and I think that it's not only military instrument of power, Today, uh, we've got this, uh, uh, when I say the fight or the competition is everywhere, it's not only on the field, it's everywhere. Weaponization of energy security, weaponization of mass migration, and then you've got economic sanction. So it's everywhere. You, you have, it is why it is very important, and when we are developing multi-domain operation, of course, it's the orchestration of the military activities in all domains in order to, to converge effects to be, and, uh, and the sum uh, of one has to be, uh, uh, has to be above than, uh, 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 sorry, the, the, the sum of uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. But it's also the synchronization with other instruments of power. That's, that's, that's something wha that we, we have seen and a regional war or is not, uh, is no more regional, it's global. What is not new or what is, um, um, I can say that uh, the nuclear deterrence. I think it's not new. Maybe it was a little bit uh, uh, not on the front, but it's, uh, and uh, of course, uh, um, the saber of, of nuclear deterrence is, is there. Um, Maybe what is new in this is the, the ability to, uh, to use the escalation dynamics in a lot of domains, economical or, or energy or uh, military. That's, that's, the, uh, that's, that's new in, in, in the concept. Uh, what is not new also is the... Um, the Russian missile challenge, it's not new. Um, and uh, of course, we, uh, we have taken the, this into account. That's a great answer. <coughs> and if you don't mind, I want to stay with Ukraine yeah. <coughs> for a few minutes because it is a laboratory <coughs> of warfare. It's a human tragedy and a strategic yeah. tragedy, but it's also, from the point of view of a defense specialist, uh, an opportunity to watch and see what's working and what's not, what's different. So if you, could, if you don't mind, I'd like to stay with this question and ask you about a, a few specific matters. So let me go back to the opening weeks of the war when Russia tried to come in from the north and take Kyiv quickly and perhaps assassinate Zelensky as well. Was there anything, when we saw that 40 mile long Russian traffic jam of vehicles that couldn't ultimately get to Kyiv and had to turn back, was that new or old? In other words, 
Was it these fancy weapons we gave the Ukrainians, these you know, uh, javelin anti-tank weapons and others from other NATO countries? Was that really the difference? Or was it more that Russia just used bad tactics? They stayed in vehicles on predictable paths, on narrow roads. It was almost in some ways evocative of how the Finns fought the Russians in 1939 and mm, 1940 mm, to me. Mm, mm. And so, is in those early weeks when the Ukrainians managed to stop the Russian attack on Kiev in particular, was that more new or more old? Well, I, th I think first, it's, it's why we are emphasizing the need to better understand, uh, to better understand the will, first to, under to better understand your adversary, but also the will of the population and how it will react. And the way uh, the ama amazing way the, the people of Ukraine are, who are fighting, the link between the political, military authorities with their people is so, so great. That's, that, that's the, their cohesion is their power. And to win a war, you need, you need that. So I think it's a lack of understanding that they can be like that, mm. first of all. So it's, it's why we are pushing a lot on better understanding. And we are pushing a lot on, of course, resilience. Uh, and resilience is not only a resilience of the armed forces, but also a, a, a societal a resilience. Um, I think also is to, and, and um, it's good for ACP to, to say that, it's uh, you, you are living in an in in environment that you have to take into account. And technology today, uh, media, uh, open source, intelligence, they are everywhere. So you have to, you have to fight with that. And, and, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, uh, um, um, and you have also to use not only military instrument of power, but you have to, to be linked with the, uh, 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 the private company uh, and, and uh, uh, the, 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 the society in order to, to uh, uh, as a team, to, uh, to, to fight and to win. And you take the example this of this calling, everybody, but even before, even before of the beginning of the war, you've got in open source uh, some, uh, some pictures of uh, logistic convoys coming from the east of Russia. So you've got already information. So I think it's, um, it's, uh, of course, this data era is a little bit new, but uh, we are already with our iPhone for or, 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 or phone uh, on, uh, uh, for uh, such a, a long time already. So we, you have to take into account this. So I've got three more questions, but I'm going to put them all into one because we've only got 15 minutes, That's and I know right. a lot of people want to get in the conversation, but it's all in the same spirit because there's just so much to learn and you're teaching me so much already. I want to ask you about three aspects, three additional aspects of the Ukraine war. One is why Ukraine's command and control and cyber systems seem to have held up so well. And should that make us more optimistic that we as an alliance could actually be resilient in the command and control and cyber realm if we ever wound up, heaven forbid, in a conflict against Russia. So cyber. Also air power. Fascinating uh, study in air power. You're an airman, as you said. And the Russians have not been able to really establish air supremacy. And really, nobody's flying that much, except with drones, compared to what I would have expected. So what, what less, I'll just leave it as an open question. What do you deduce so far about the lessons of this war for the future of air power? And then the third piece is the famous, it's not the only system, but you know, we're Americans. We talk about our own technology. So HIMARS, high mobility uh, <coughs> artillery rocket system, and the extreme accuracy of that rocket. Uh, how important has that and other systems from NATO that we've managed to send to the Ukrainians, how important have they been? But even more, how important are they going to be? I realize your job is not to focus on the Ukraine conflict day in and day out. Other people in NATO are doing that. You're supposed to think longer term. But what are you learning about the future of warfare by watching precision artillery? So mm. cyber, air power, and artillery. Maybe, what, whatever yeah, you want to touch maybe on. Maybe I'm going to, to jump in an artillery uh, point of view. But just to say that, for example, ACP with ACO, we are, I'm, I'm, I'm leading the lessons learned of Ukraine. So uh, it, it's not because um, we have to learn from the past or today to, to, uh, uh, to, to be able to foresee the future. Uh, 
uh, it's very important in order to take into account the, the, the lessons first identify and then learn. Um, and um, so IMARS, you, you IMARS is, is uh, but it's it's like other weapons or other system. The the thing is, we need uh, precision, and we need agility. That's that's the way. You, you can you can have different uh, things once you do to dash it, not only uh, IMARS. So it's a uh, it's very important. And uh, then the beauty of the thing is not only the system; is the system of system is is the way you are going to link these to other, uh, either the C2 or either the uh, 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 another sensor who will get you, get the information in order to use it. Right. So it's, the technology is not only the precision, it's uh, also you can move fast because uh, otherwise it will be targeted. Right. And uh, the, the, the ability to, to dock to every open architecture. So that's important. Um, yeah. So I think you, you, you can have the best, uh, the best equipment, uh, but if you don't know how to use it at the maximum, or if you don't have the command and control to use it, so it's it's uh, it's going to be difficult. You are not going to uh, to be as strong as 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 uh, uh, as you can. Uh, you can you can have the uh, you, uh, you can be so I, th I think it's not only um, a question of uh, uh, equipment it's also training uh, it's it's also uh, a command and control that's that's very important and of course Ukraine has got also uh, uh, they they know very well the 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 the, so the, the Soviet equipment no? so it's uh, it's also something that we, we, we have to take into account and, and the doctrine also. Um, the f your first question. The first question, I think that um, before the war, uh, and, and we have a strong, we have, we had, and we have, and we will have uh, strongly with the uh, Ukrainian. And we work a lot uh, with them, for example, and it's very important. And when I say talent, talent is so important. We have uh, helped them to uh, uh, um, to build the non-commissioned officers structure, and and they've got people who are um, during uh, more than eight years they they have been trained with us, and so they've got the this agility, this open-minded uh, uh, talent. And uh, to, as I explained, you, to be agile is something that helps you to, 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 to fight even if you are against a, a, a bigger uh, uh, adversary. So talents are very important and they've got them. And of course they are very, uh, 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 they are very open. They've got, they are minister of uh, uh, um, digitalization uh, intervene in our uh, uh, conference of innovation we had uh, two weeks ago, I think, and uh, he was talking about the app I was talking to you. And this app was developed with NATO, so it's uh, it's the way they they the speed the speed to integrate this new technology and this new way of warfare is so important. I'm still impressed and surprised as to how well their communication systems have held up. I thought that the Russians would have been able to take them down much more effectively through a combination of physical and cyber yeah, attack. Yeah. But you folks have yeah, yeah, and, a couple and, and, of tricks and, up and, your and you've got and you've got also this this link with uh, private companies. Uh, Starlink, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, was uh, uh, was so important uh, to keep the the links between all of them and uh, all of the this equipment. Of course, great. Well, fascinating. I'd go on, but I want to bring in others too. We've got about 10 minutes left, so let me see who would like to raise a question. We're going over here, please. Good afternoon, General. Uh, my question is regarding uh, two key points that you discussed in your remarks. First, the coming ascension of Sweden and Finland to the alliance, uh, and second, the crucial role you discussed of interoperability to our mm -hmm. capabilities. Um, so my question is, in your view, what unique capabilities do both Sweden and Finland pose um, that will complement the fighting capabilities of the alliance going forward? Well, for Finland and Sweden, it's not only capability, it is uh, 
they offering, for example, for the Baltic uh, nation, the strategic depth they need to def deter and defend, so it's uh, great. Uh, as I say, uh, they've got this total defense for Finland or this comprehensive security for uh, 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 Sweden. I mean that they, they have worked for, me for years and years on their resilience, their, uh, uh, their uh, people resilience. So it's so, uh, and so important. Finland can, uh, in terms of energy, uh, they, they, can, they can rebuild their energy grid so quick. So it's, it's so important to, for us to, to learn about them huh, and, and, and to, to be stronger. So it's th th there, are, there are two, uh, uh, two things they are going to, to bring. And of course, they've got also, as you say, capabilities and, uh, and uh, they've got a very strong uh, uh, defense uh, industry base. But they've got also university, the, the NDU, uh, uh, the, the National University in, uh, in Stockholm is very, very important. Uh, in Finland, they've got, uh, they are one of the five top uh, quantum university there. So, so for us, it's, it's great to have them. Yeah? Excellent. Sir. Uh, my name is Ryan Thompson. I'm with the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Uh, General, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Um, so with respect, uh, when considering Ukraine, I like to uh, first consider the 2014 uh, annexation of Crimea. Uh, I would argue it would serve as an excellent indicator for what would eventually become Russia's full-out invasion of Ukraine. Um, so my question for you specifically is what uh, proactive actions, if any, uh, can Western military Western militaries and NATO members take to prevent or at least mitigate uh, long coming yet seemingly inevitable uh, events such as Russia's U invasion of Ukraine without uh, instigating a new conflict altogether and in the worst case scenario starting a third world war? Uh, I think, uh, as I said, the, the, the thing is that, uh, and I think it's the uh, Secretary General who say that we. We, we need and we have to project stability uh, uh, outside the, the border of, uh, of, of NATO. So I think it's the first thing to do, and, but it's not, I mean, we see, uh, it's not convenient. Uh, then you, you have to, uh, and we have uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of programs, several programs to, uh, it's, cap it's called capacity building. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, when you, uh, talk about, for example, uh, 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 non-commissioned officers uh, to be trained, to be uh, trained with NATO standards. It, it, it means that at the end, it shows that it works and they, it's, it's uh, uh, leveraging their level uh, to defend themselves. And when you leverage your, 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 your the, the level of your defense, uh, you deter because the, the cost will be much higher for uh, an aggressor. And, and we've got a lot of <coughs> this type of capacity building. We've done, uh, we, we've got a new one with Mauritania. We've got, uh, we continue to, uh, uh, to increase with Tunisia. We, we've got a good partnership with Jordan, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's the way we have. And the thing is also, and we are, and it's, and it's in our concept, uh, this, the, the concept of AGP. And it's close to what you've got in your new national, uh, uh, U.S. national defense strategy, it is called campaigning. And we call it shape and contest. And to sh when you shape and contest, of course, you, you impose dilemma, but you also uh, um, increase the difficulty of the adversary to defend themselves. Let me stay over here for a minute. Have your question, please. Hi, my name is Saria Dodi. I'm here with the Naples Council on World Affairs. Um, you discussed in great detail how artificial intelligence is becoming one of the most lucrative industries in terms of military capabilities. And in terms of, you know, countries within NATO, but also in other parts of the world, developing these AI strategies, how do you feel that this has an impact on the definition of power and what it means to be dominant in the international system in this age of technology and advancement? Um, we've got, um, of course, we are not working uh, alone and we're, we are working with 30 and two more 32 nations which have their own development on that topic and of course the beauty of NATO is to to have to understand the, dif the difference 
perspective and to have a, to join on a common perspective. And so we've got this uh, artificial intelligence policy. We've got also the data because it's it's very linked, uh, uh, the, the data and uh, what we are looking at is of course no more a network centric but a data centric uh, uh, organization, software based with uh, of course security as a uh, um, umbrella or, uh, or even not an umbrella but as an entry. So it's a, um, it's, it's a huge uh, challenge but the, my, my, my I think we've got already the tools. We were just talking uh, about the banks and the banks and the trade offer us uh, the, the, the very good example how to, how to share the data in a very secure way. Maybe sometimes too secure, but in a, in a, in a, in a, in a secure way. So, so we have, in, in defense, we are no more in need in this, uh, in this, uh, domain uh, in this area, we are to be the, the a fast follower in order to, you know, in order to, uh, uh, to win, to, to understand better and to decide faster. But the, the thing is that we need also the, all the nations to work on the internal data policy, sharing data policy, because there are more risks today not to share than to share. And, uh, and of course, you have, we have also to work on uh, making the data more institutional and not the data, the data owners is no more the industry or the private sector. It has to be the data we are producing as a arms process has to be uh, governmental data. Then, then when you've got that, you can produce uh, software, for example, and interoperability will be better and easier. I think we have time for two more. Let's take these two together if we could right here, both of you, and then we'll come back to the uh, general. Okay, uh, thank you, General. General, there's been a, a lot of instability on the southern flank of NATO in North Africa and the African states, basically failing states and leading to large migration, all flowing and stuff. What role do you see for NATO in possibly, you know, shoring up these states, helping the states there get stronger? I mean, there's obviously a civilian and a military component too, but do you see a role for NATO? And then, ma'am, over to you. General. Okay. Uh, nice open-ended question. We used uh, drones before this war. Uh, what have you learned that you can reveal from the use of drones in Ukraine? So, so, I don't understand the, the question. Oh, she asked what have drones. you learned uh, from the use oh, yeah, of yeah. drones? Mm. <laughs> drones, yes, yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, um, unmanned system is of course uh, something we, it's not new, as you say, uh, it's not new. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, it, uh, the, the, the last, the, uh, the last war was uh, uh, Armenia uh, versus uh, Azerbaijan mm. and the, the use of, uh, of these drones. Uh, and, and of course, we, um, we are always working on the, to counter this, uh, the, this threat. Um, it's, uh, what is maybe a little bit new is the, 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 the link between uh, Russia and some, uh, some countries, for example, Ivan. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is a, a point for us to, to, uh, to work on this new reality, what will be the, the links uh, uh, of Russia uh, with some, uh, some countries. Uh, the South, the South is, uh, you know, in, in the strategic concept, we, we we, we mentioned this 360 degree approach because we, uh, we have to uh, defend and, 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 and protect one billion of, uh, of people and, and they are not only uh, on the Western border. And so it's very important for us to, to keep, the, uh, uh, to keep the, a good understanding on that, to protect stability. It's why I'm, I, have, I have talked about the, this uh, program uh, and this uh, 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 with uh, Mauritania, for example, with Tunisia, with, uh, and uh, we've got uh, uh, dialogue, of course, with uh, uh, different country uh, in, uh, in the South. The South, Russia are, are already there. Huh? We, when we were talking about Wagner, for example, Chinese are, are also in the US. So it's, uh, uh, it's very important that we, 
not only understand that we uh, shape the environment in this uh, in, in this uh, uh, area uh, and uh, uh, um, while projecting uh, stability and uh, and uh, relationships please join me in thanking general <laughs> Lebrun. Thank you. That was a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate both of you delivering it for us. Uh, Michael O'Hanlon's book, his latest book is The Art of War in an Age of Peace. It's outside, he'll sign some copies. He has another one coming out early next year. Uh, the general's a little less prolific with books, but I'm gonna encourage him to write La Cuisine C'est Moi. Uh, okay. And uh, if you will co-author with me, Le, yeah. le Rugby C'est Nous. Oui, oh, perfect, oui. perfect, yes, bon. oui, super. Super chouette. Good afternoon. We are going to get out so they can clean up for our two o'clock panel on Myanmar. Again, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Thank Merci you. Beaucoup. Thank you. Beaucoup. Thank you.